Hello, everyone, and a very warm welcome to the long-awaited relaunch of the RPA podcast, The Player's Voice. I'm your host, Ethan Waller, chair of the RPA Players Board, and I'm also joined today by my co-host, Christian Day, former chair and current RPA General Secretary. Christian, how the devil are you? Hello, Ethan. I'm not aware I'm the co-host. I think... <laughs> I'm a guest appearance tonight, but uh, I'm, I'm... I've decided you're the co-host. I, I'm eager to uh, to listen to your professional performance and more importantly, to talk to three uh, three current superstars of the game. What a delightful segue. Uh, with this episode being released on International Women's Day, we are delighted to be joined by some of the best characters in the game to discuss all things women's rugby. With us tonight, we have Sarah Beckett, Sarah Byrne and Zoe Harrison. Thank you all for coming on. It's great to have you. Uh, how are we all, first and foremost? We'll, we'll start with you, Sarah Beckett. Uh, in fact, actually, before we start, to, to, to leave out any confusion for the listeners, and uh, Sarah Beckett and Sarah Byrne, I can't call you Sarah, Sarah. I can't call you Sarah B. What's the best way to go about this? It, for you two, you must have had this problem before. Yeah, I just get called Beckett usually. Yeah, I just get called B- Burner. So. Beckett and Burner, job done. Perfect. <laughs> well, in that case, um, Beckett, we'll, we'll start with you. How are you? Gloucester Heartbreed this year, absolutely flying. Um, I saw a couple of a couple of weeks ago. Obviously, there was a bit of a setback at, at Saracens, but this weekend there was a phenomenal response against DMP with the, with the 16-nil scoreline. How's it been for you so far? How's the season been? Yeah, it's been good. Um, yeah, it was a tough decision to move to Gloucester, um, but really happy I did it. Um, we've been going well. We created some good momentum. Obviously, had a bit of a stumbling block against Saracens, but um, I think we learned a lot from that game, to be honest. Um, and you know, we said it's better to make those mistakes now than hopefully later on in the season. So, um, yeah, we've, we've been been on a good run, but plenty to improve on still. But just really enjoy my time here. But how have you uh, have you found the the difference between being between there and Harlequins? How's it how's it been for you that move? Yeah, it's different setups. I think at the time I was moving, it was obviously a bit turbulent with World Cup selection not quite going my way and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, falling on my feet really. The the girls are a great group of girls and um, feel really supported, and the staff are great. And yeah, it was a difficult time, but yeah, just loving it and really brought some like joy back to my rugby. I think. I think that's massive, isn't it? The, the, the joy of rugby, actually enjoying what you're doing, almost gives you an entire new lease of life when it comes to play. And so it's fantastic to hear that the, the things are going well. So we'll uh, we'll, we'll move on to, to you, Berner. Um, without bringing up any old wounds, I, I'd like to sort of, I'd like to revisit the World Cup if I can, which was a truly phenomenal campaign for the Red Roses. And whilst obviously there was the, the disappointment in the final, there must have been some some massive massive highs of that tournament. What what were they for you? Um, I think, yeah, get, obviously getting to the final, that, that was never a given. We had a really hard few fights, especially against France and Canada. Um, so yeah, getting to the final, absolutely amazing. And then playing in front of that crowd, um, fair play to New Zealand. They they got 4,000 people there. Um, so it was, even though they were all supporting New Zealand, <laughs> it was it was still a very good experience to to be surrounded by that and just so they had such momentum over there how many people were interested you'd walk around the street and they'd be like oh uh, we're coming to watch on the weekend so it was just great to feel that buzz around women's rugby um, but yeah I can say the cherry on top would have been winning um, we didn't quite get that but yeah proud of all the girls and all the hard work that went into it um, there was also one more thing uh, whilst, I, whilst I was doing a bit of prep for this uh, I was reading an interview with yourself where you described yourself as a scrum geek which I have so much time for and I don't actually have any questions on that I just wanted to mention it because I, I love meeting someone with a similar passion for scrums and it's <laughs> rare. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think you have to learn to love it. When you find out how hard it is and how much you have to think about it, I think, you know, you have a real respect for it. Um, I think when I was a back row, I just thought, oh, just push as hard as you can. Why is it not working? <laughs> but now, yeah, definitely. It, it is. It's a hard job. <laughs> That's me wondering why it's not working. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Zoe, Nice to see you here as well. Um, really, really sorry to hear about your ACL injury. That must have been a really tough one to receive. But but I saw on your Instagram that you, you've had the surgery. How, how are things going for you from a recovery point of view? And, and how are you generally? Yeah, so um, it was quite tough. Um, I've tried to be as positive as I can be to this point until... So I had my surgery on Wednesday and I went into Saracen State for the first time. Physio decided to uh, touch the uh, knee. She just 
slammed the hand, hand straight down on all the stitches and I've never screamed so so much in my life all those boys in there like um, they just finished their session they were like turn around everyone just stopped I just started like tears came out my eyes and I was like okay probably probably needed the tears to come out a bit um, <laughs> I probably needed her to hurt me a little bit so the tears could come out um, but yeah other than that it's just I know it's going to be a long road ahead but I'm I'm that sort of person that already is trying to be like nah it won't be nine months it'll be quicker than that I'm going to make sure it's quicker than that sort of thing so trying to stay as positive as I can and basically be in competition with myself and beat myself absolutely I think that's it's definitely the best way to be but just, just before we move on I'm assuming the uh, putting the hand on you was that intentional or is like maybe she's tripped on the way uh, yeah she no no she, she had to but obviously she like didn't mean to grab like where the stitching was but yeah just came in a little bit too aggressive, but yeah, yeah, too aggressive. Show. Oh, yeah. sorry, heavy hand. I was like, yeah, you think? <laughs> so, and obviously, you're you're a naturally competitive person. Competing with yourself, especially in 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 that rehab space, is going to be a massive thing to help you get through. But do you have anything planned for sort of outside of the rehab um, for this time? I know you've got your your degree in sports rehab and, and exercise, but is there anything else that you've got going on outside of rugby? Uh, no, I haven't. My other passions are normally sport, so would have loved to play some golf, but can't really twist on the knee now, can you? Not a um, so not not that much. Just trying to stay as involved with the rugby as possible. Like with the Saracens girls, they've still got stuff going on uh, while um, the Red Roses are in camp. Um, and when they're obviously playing, I'll go up and watch them, try to work around the game day as much as possible and keep, keep myself involved. But I'm sure like once I can, um, once I can move the knee a little bit more, then more stuff will be happening. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, any plans to do anything, any sort of the analysis stuff, maybe help with some of the coaching? Yeah, yeah. So I'll be helping. Yeah, I'll be helping out a lot at Saracens um, with that. I've already been a bit of a nose and asking the backs coach. You know, like obviously there won't be clips of me, but can you get clips of other people and basically teach me through them. Perfect. It's so nose, isn't it? It, it is. Love the life. That's, that's what we're here for. We're here. Be as nosy on this podcast as physically possible. <laughs> is what we're here for. He'll be playing all the war zone. <laughs> oh god yeah right come back it won't be a 30 win streak streak it'll be 30 kill streak <laughs> uh, and finally Christian how have the first few months as general secretary been from you from an RPA point of view clearly it's been pretty busy how's it all been going it feels like three months but it's been three weeks um yeah, everything's kind of going on at once at the moment. So I'm not going to I'm not going to bore everyone, but there's there's loads going on in the men's game and there's loads going on in the women's game. Um, so I'm not going to bore everyone. I'm I'm more excited that Zoe likes playing golf. Um, Bernard Bernard's a scrum geek. Um, I'll tell you one thing that's noticeable, and I, I wonder, Sarah, if, if you answer this. So when I've been to watch the Red Roses, I've been to two or three games now. And the crowd is completely different to a men's game. Like it is, it's like this constant chatter that is like livelier. Um, and the New Zealand crowd look the same. So, so looking at that, it just seemed like there's a completely different audience in the stadium. I think we generally, as uh, women in sport, we get maybe get some more families. Um, you know, it's a lot more um, affordable for for big groups of people especially families come out and watch us so potentially it could just be the adults telling the kids what the rules are or <laughs> but um that nah, um yeah we always have brilliant fans and and actually afterwards the young if the young kids that the amount of kids that come up and they want to see you and we you know all our first on the red roses make sure we stay out and say thank you to them because without those guys you we probably wouldn't have a professional contract so yeah there our fans are really important to us red roses well, you you know I've queued up for those selfies before with my daughter. So, um, yeah, you'll have 40,000 selfies at Twickenham, hopefully, in the spring. So <laughs> It's also cause, because we score some unreal tries, so you've got little girls screaming all the time. That's where yeah. the come from. Also that, sorry, also that. <laughs> <laughs> that's some great scrum pens as well. Go on, let's not leave that out. <laughs> yeah, that's the real bit. That's, the, that's what everyone comes to work. Correct. No, I'll admit it, they was doing it. <laughs> um, perfect. So, so moving on, something that has been announced recently um, is the RFU groundbreaking new maternity policy for for the Red Roses. And to nutshell some of the information for, for listeners who may not be aware, it's 
England players contracted to the RFU will benefit from a new maternity policy that includes 26 weeks of leave on full pay. And also included is the capacity for pregnant players to perform other roles within rugby um, until they begin that maternity leave. Uh, clearly, this is this is a big step forward and a bit uh, an even bigger step towards, you know, how professional the game's turning now. From your guys' point of view, uh, how important is it to have this policy in place? I think it's great, and as you said, it just shows how how like professional it it is now going. And um, as you may know, um, Abby Ward is now pregnant, so it's great that it's come into light now. Um, we've got some uh, quite a few young girls, that obviously in the future, um, who have partners that in the future will either want to get pregnant or have uh, babies, or their partners will have babies, and it just gives us the opportunity to to have that family you know and opportunities I don't think people uh, may look at it like this but for us uh, a lot of us do is that you see the men all the time after the games at home bringing their kids on the pitch and it's just like to see that it's like I I would love to bring um, what uh, uh, one of my children not I have children but a child maybe in the future on the pitch you know we've got um Marley who um has Oliver at the moment it's so sweet when he gets to come on the pitch you know after the games and it's so cute and I think for a lot of the girls we'd we'd want that for for each other and ourselves and for the RFU to recognize that and um you know put this um maternity uh I want to say policy is it policy in place for us um I, I think is great yeah, like definitely on that. Uh, you know, in any other job, it, there's a maternity policy where you, you know, you're free to go and leave, and your job's not at risk. And I think that's what was never there before. Obviously, when you're an athlete, your prime athlete, athletic ages are obviously when you also childbearing ages. It's it doesn't come it comes hand in hand. So have the ability to still be a high end athlete. Um, like at Bears, I see Abby every day. She is training just as hard. Actually, some of her sessions are absolutely vile. And I said the other day, like, I'm very glad I'm not pregnant because they look awful. <laughs> um, but yeah, like, um, it's it's brilliant to have that equal opportunity and not be worried or it not be a disadvantage that you can't come back into the into a role into something that you have given your whole life to. Um, so it's going to be really exciting to see how that falls in, into place and and hopefully we'll have some little roses in and out of camp, which I think all the girls will absolutely adore. And it's really cool how um, like they're giving girls opportunities to go into different roles. So Abby's in, in camp coaching and shadowing Deeks while she's in so that she can still feel connected to the group, even though she can't physically perform with us. She can have a massive input into what the group's doing and how the group's performing and still feel like she's a part of that group because she's an England player, she's a Red Rose and that's what she's paid to do. And that input for us as a group as well is really valuable as Abby's one of the leaders in the in the group. So to not miss that um, in any way, shape or form in, in terms of around camp is great. Do you see that as, as one of the, the, the vital aspects to it, that that still being able to, to contribute to environments, even when you can't necessarily train in, in the same way that you could have before? Yeah, 100%. I think that's when, especially when athletes get injured, I think that's what sends them into a bit of a dark place when you can't feel like you can contribute to the group. And I think a pregnancy, though it's not an injury, it can be a bit um, difficult. Obviously, I've not experienced it, but I can imagine it could be quite difficult to try and stay connected and try and um, keep in with the group and stuff like that because you spend so much time as a group and you'd obviously be on a different schedule because you can't be in training and all that stuff. So I think being able to contribute to the group's training in a different way in terms of coaching and analysing and stuff like that, like Zoe is with her injury, um, mirrored with Abby with her pregnancy, which I think is really important. Christian, obviously you, you were pretty instrumental in playing a part in this. What, what are your thoughts yeah, on that? Yeah, it's, um, it, it's two and a half years of work. Um, we, we, we started off looking at the old policy and and we knew that in the Southern Hemisphere they'd taken some big steps forward, particularly in Australia. Um, and New Zealand had followed suit. Um, and we, we have been, you know, working at this really, really hard to try and get it somewhere where, where we can be really proud of it. Um, and fair play to the RFU. They they played a big part in that. Um, and I guess the most important thing about it is, and, and it's interesting, the girls saying about like seeing the guys bring their kids onto the pitch. You know, a, a, a men's player would never worry about becoming pregnant, uh, becoming pregnant, having a child. Um, it's just part of part of life. And what this policy should do is just remove that taboo for the for the the roses, hopefully in terms of it's completely normal to have 
to have a child when you're a professional athlete. And, and this should hopefully make it as safe as it can be. Um, but most importantly, a, allow a fair opportunity to get back into that shirt afterwards. Um, so, so like I said, it's, it was a lot of work, but but to see it announced was something I was, um, you know, really proud to be part of. And hopefully it's, uh, it helps what well, we're going to see Abbey Ward right now, starting to, to hopefully go through it and, and hopefully it works. And if not, we'll make adjustments, but it's, uh, it's certainly a huge leap forward. And I can tell you there are numerous other sports contacting us now saying, how did you do it? What did you do? Why did you do it? So it's, um, yeah, something proud to be part of. It's, it's a huge step forward and it, it's massively positive to, to not only see it, but clearly hear how impactful it's going to be from, from, from all of you. Um, the, the, the Christian, just, just on the I say the logistical side of things, logistical is the completely wrong word, but during this entire process, um, there was clearly a large input from, from the players. Tell me, tell me how important the players voice was in, in all of this. Yeah, there were, um, there were four or five different players involved. Um, from England sevens players and then 15s players as well. Um, and they played a huge part in terms of just saying what would work, what wouldn't, uh, particularly in terms of like being in camp, um, trying to make things again, just feel normal, feel, feel like there's a place. Um, so I, I hope we will see some little, uh, little roses running around in camp, uh, hopefully not causing too much chaos. <laughs> and, and on the back of that announcement, um, recently, the RPA have also announced their their new membership for the Premier 15s players. Um, girls, just just how significant is that news for you? Yeah, it's absolutely massive. I mean, the RPA have done so much for us as Roses in terms of our contracts and and the maternity policy and X, Y, and Z. And actually, it is probably about time where professionalism is coming into the women's Premiership and those same conversations, the same issues that we were facing, but potentially um, it might feel a little bit more isolating outside because uh, we, we're one squad where actually this is loads of different clubs and um, it definitely helps players just have someone to talk to, uh, someone to help with contractual stuff or anything that they need. Um, it's absolutely massive. Um, so it's great that the, the RPA have managed to, to get get into clubs and hopefully that will be something that really grows and grows um, like it like it is in the men's and, and provide that support and that kind of lifestyle help outside of rugby, um, which I think is definitely needed at this point in time. Yeah, I'd, I'd just back up what Berna said then, is that like they help us so much as Roses, it's just nice to see that they can help other girls just outside of our squad as well, because they at times need as equally as much help as as we do because a lot of them are balancing rugby and work life as well so to have that extra help when they need it just to go ask something someone something and that help be provided for them is great i think um we, we've we've actually been supporting the red roses or the in fact england sevens team initially now for 10 years so the rpa have been involved with with women's rugby for some time but um certainly for me in, in terms of when i was looking to be appointed as general secretary, one thing I said was I wanted to open membership up to, to all Premier 15s players. Um, and and I know that other candidates had said that as well. Like the RPA this year, one of our key focuses is is women's rugby. Um, so, it, you know, for me, it was the right thing to do. And, and we're going to talk about equality later. But I, I do think we've provided good support to the Red Roses, but the, there was starting to be a question of why why wouldn't we support the Premier 15s, which is such an amazing, like vibrant league and it's being created. I'm going to say co-created actually, because uh, Belinda Moore and, and Genevieve Shaw are seemingly creating this with a real um, sense of growth. They want the players involved from day one in terms of how it's going to be built. Um, I think the league is growing and we're starting to see women's football now in, in their domestic league. I think there were 30,000, I think, watching the cup final at the weekend. Like, if you build it, people will come and watch. Um, and it's also important to say um, the WRA are doing work in this space, and they really did step up at a time when, you know, when when we weren't there. So I think for the last 12 months or so, they've offered membership, and we very much want to work with the WRA and um, we've had a lot of positive meets already. Um, 
but ultimately we want to provide, you know, we, we've been in existence for about 25 years now. We want to provide the same levels of support for the women as we do for the men. And that means personal development. It means, uh, you know, mental welfare support. It means representation. Um, and, and yeah, like I said, for me, it was really important that we stepped into this space and offered it at the end of the day where we're a membership organization, people can choose to join or, or they don't have to join. Um, but we want to make sure the offer is there. So off the back of that, so just circling back round to the, the Premier 15s and obviously the direction that the competition is going at the moment. This year has been a massively competitive year, but clearly the future looks like it's going to be really exciting and it's going to grow to, to in an exponential way. How exciting is, is that for you as players who are in this league week in, week out? How exciting is that it for you? It feels like it's about to explode, really. I think you've seen it in women's football Um and hopefully we can follow that curve that it's going to go up and be a part of it. And also for our voices, that in a way, like be able to shape the way that our game grows and how we want to see it grow and have an impact on the people after us. So like we may not see it become fully pre- fully professional, but we can make sure it's in a better space for the people who are 18, say now, who in 10 years time, they're aiming to be fully professional. And if we can put the game in a better place now for those girls coming through, hopefully they won't have some of the challenges that we've had to battle through at this point and um, had to fight for things to be equal or things to be better. Um, and I think that's really exciting to be part of the RPA in ways that I know all three of us are and have our voices heard as a player group to be able to craft the game into what we want it to be. Absolutely. And and with this growing, clearly it's it's going to need a lot of collaboration from, from the players. And, and as Christian's already said, um, Belinda Moore and, and, and Genevieve Shaw have, have already made the point that they want players involved. So I suppose I'll ask this question individually, but I guess what would be your your ideal sort of end game? Where, where would you love to see the game? What sort of what sort of tangible features would you love to see in the game as it as it grows? Would you like to see sort of set up stadiums? What would be your your absolute dream for for the women's game? Um, I would for me it would be going fully professional. I mean it might not obviously in ours, but I'd love to see it go um, professional. Um, so like as I say, girls don't have to go to work like this is that this is their work. Um, you see how far the women's game has come like post COVID and still half of them are, you know, coming from work to training that evening. What is it gonna go to if everyone was actually fully professional? Like it I think it could yeah, it could just go up so many levels so quickly. Um, but also Another one would be like not filling out, say, stadiums. I wouldn't say that so quickly because some of the boys still don't fill out the stadiums. Um, uh, but I would say like filling a, filling a stadium at least, like, you know, getting quite a few bums on seats, you know, having only a few spare seats. Um, obviously, we're doing that as Red Roses, but I'd like that to come into our club into club form for us. And yeah, mine is exactly the same as a fully professional Um getting you know a broadcasting making sure our things are there bbc are great um like with the streams and everything it's brilliant we get loads of viewers in also really handy if you're not playing you can watch everyone else's game so <laughs> it's really good um but you know have a broadcast they'll have everyone professional it, it's such a struggle it, for the girls it, it really is to see them coming in trying to be on the full-time program and do work and rest and it's just an impossible and have a social life like it's fair play to all the girls that do that I don't know we've got a few doctors or um, girls that just work non-stop just to be able to to live essentially and that'll be great if if we can get everyone pro and on on really some really really good wages um, and yeah selling out selling out um, stadiums you know like basically mirroring mirroring women's football um i think that that is for me would be the best the best outcome we can hope for and hopefully the path that we're following now yeah i completely agree and i think within that change in the narrative of how some people perceive women's sport as we go like i think we're doing it slowly and surely now and i think that's why you're seeing crowds build and everything else but if we can change the narrative in the domestic game as well as the international game i think that would be a massive draw for people whether that's um newspaper articles or just more exposure on social media stuff like that i'd love to see that grow with more positive outlooks for people so that we can grow our own personal brands we can grow our own like club brands and people become 
who they want to be within that space. Becky, you have almost seamlessly brought me on to my next point, which is perfect. So uh, today, slash the, the day the pod's released, uh, is, is International Women's Day. Uh, and we wanted to reflect on that. The theme this year for, for International Women's Day is embracing equality. And now, as a society, I think, as you say, there's, there's a desire for change and everything from a rugby point of view is definitely going in the right direction. But how is... Uh, a rugby community, can we really embrace that from a rugby point of view, that that desire for change and showcase that it truly is a sport for everyone? I think a big one for me within women's rugby is just making sure our peers understand. I think when I've been at clubs before, like some of the guys don't realise that half our girls aren't full time and they happen to go to work and then come in at in the evening and they don't realise why we have to train in the evening so we're not done at training until like half nine sometimes at night Um, and I think people hearing stories people understanding stories and understanding why our game is where it is and what they can do to help is a massive thing I think just a bit of um, I can't remember the word but being able to just like grow our game so that's like sharing it on social media or just getting behind us going go into a game or put in on social media that they're going to go to like their plat- men's platforms are usually bigger than ours and we can only share it so far and I think we need those allies to go out and be like look get behind the girls like this is this is what we need and I think certain clubs and certain um players are great allies I think we do have really good allies but I think we as a rugby community could get behind our game a little bit more in terms of allyship and being able to promote um, women's rugby more yeah and I'd say watch it if you want to help us stick it on even if you're not doing even if you can't watch the telly put it on something so we get those viewing figures because you know if you're out for a walk stick it on your phone put it back in your pocket Keep the viewing figures high. Um, that's it. We need people watching it. We need people coming to the game. So if you're if you're local to the area, pop a ticket. Like get 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 something down. Um, for us, that's what we need. And we need and keep telling everyone how much you've enjoyed it. I think that's the biggest difference I've noticed in the last few years. Is especially potentially the, the older generation. Some of my dad's friends. Dad texted me saying, "Oh, my mate watched it, and he said this was actually really, really good." And I'm like, "Well, <laughs> yeah, it's exactly the same thing. So it should be pretty good." <laughs> um, so yeah, it's getting people to watch it, and like Becca said, getting everyone to stuck in and behind us. Really, um, I think the rugby community have done really well, but I think we can push into other sports. If you've got friends that enjoy cricket or whatever, like just to give it a chance and, and watch us. Um, I think that's really what what we need and just in, encourage us to, to get behind and positive and, and also celebrate. I think as women, um, we're not very good at celebrating achievements of other women. Um, I think just as a rule. Um, and I think, you know, if we celebrate a tennis champion, like everyone should celebrate us. If we celebrate the women's football, you know, get behind us. Generally, that's really good in women's football and women's rugby. I feel like we get behind each other really well. But I think just women in sport just, yeah, keep celebrating each other, keep pushing it and keep posting it around. And eventually I think we'll get there. Um, mine would be the just watching it like do not judge it until you watch it because the amount of people that say, oh, I, that was amazing. And a lot of people actually start to enjoy it more than they enjoy men's rugby. Um I've heard a lot, um, but I mean, I guess they're going to say that because I'm obviously the one playing it. But um, <laughs> no, but uh, a lot of like, as you can see, the crowds have grown. Everything, everyone, like people have given it a chance. They now love it. They now want to come back so much more. And also, give it a chance because the other day I was on Twitter and there was a boy. This is football, but there was a boy who said, "Oh, I hated football." Or oh, someone like Chloe Kelly, you're my favourite person ever. I hated football before. I never wanted to go. And now I'm always down um, every Sunday playing football. And I love it now. And it was all because, it was a little boy saying that, all because he was watching the girls' Euros. And he now loves Chloe Kelly. So it's not just the girls should back the girls. Like, boys back us. Like, we can get anyone into it. Um, anyone can get anyone into sport. So I think um, give it a go. Like, watch it. Give it a go yourself. Um and yeah, just keep backing us, all the people that are already backing us. Get your friends involved. Keep telling people about it. Um, let's grow the crowds because look at what Twickenham's doing at the moment. We're, we're selling those tickets pretty well. Like how much, how how good would that be when it comes to the World Cup in England? And just on that point, like uh, back to the original question you asked about what's the end goal? 
I think like if we can have young boys and girls growing up not seeing the difference between a men's rugby game and a women's rugby game, they might be played slightly differently, but actually the stigma's gone. It's not a shock that men's professional women, it's not bad, there's no negative connotations to it. I think that's for me, I think way away into the future if we can get rid of the the negatives and the kind of stigma around women's rugby and it's just the equal two games of sport that people love to go and watch. I think that would definitely be a goal. Excuse me. And, and one of the, the overarching things I got from, from all three of you there is really that a lot of the things that we can do to help promote the game and, and sort of take away from that stigma is that they're also easy. It's sharing things on social media. It's like you say, it's turning on the telly, it's watching it. It's, it's ultimately giving it a chance if you haven't before, because like you say, it's a phenomenal brand of rugby and watching it is, uh, I'd agree with you, Zoe, is, is probably more entertaining <laughs> than, uh, than, than watching the men's game. And I think if we can encourage, even encourage five or six people that we know to 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 have a go and have a look at it if they haven't before, that that would make a huge difference. <laughs> Christian, uh, from a sort of a, a a global point of view, equality is a vital aspect for rugby union. Yeah, isn't it? I mean, I mean, rugby union is the uh, its big strength is it's for all shapes, all sizes, um, everyone's included, everyone everyone can play. So, um. I think the Red Roses are a, a fantastic uh, ambassador for that, and and indeed the the Premier Fifteens is becoming so. So it's interesting hearing about you know what just just watch it, and you know you don't even have to watch it. And that's rubbish, Sarah. I think uh, I think the product's really good. So um, I can tell you, is is some good facts for you. So last season at Gloucester, the second biggest crowd of the year was the Red Roses. The the Gloucester men's team only beat the Red Roses once. And this year at Kingston Park, the Red Roses will sell it out. And that'll be the biggest crowd at Kingston Park this season, uh, guaranteed. Um, 40,000 at Twickenham coming to watch. Um, and I think next year in the Premier 15s, you're going to see crowds start to grow because you're going to have Leicester Tigers come in who could who get, you know, they'll get several thousand going to the men's second team game. So the, the women's team are going to get big crowds. Extra Chiefs are starting to regularly get big crowds. I think, I think the growth has started, and and really now actually it's more about sustaining that growth and and making sure that people keep coming back. And that's why the, the girls on this call are so important because you are such a brilliant, um, I hate to say it, but brand. You're you're so approachable. You're so um, you're so the game itself is so exciting to watch. So you you girls have got to keep that going because that that's what will grow the club game. And and you know that that makes it a sport for all. A massively exciting time coming up for the Premier Fifteens, but also coming very very soon. Uh, we've, we've got the Six Nations. Obviously, it's coming to an end pretty soon for for the men's competition, but the women's tournament is about to get started. So, in your girls' opinion, which teams are most likely to challenge the Red Roses this year for the title? Um... Um, I think France. Oh, go on, so go on, so you yeah, go. I, I was going to say France as well. It's always a big game, and it's going to be at Twickenham, so they're going to be gunning for us. But obviously, we're gonna we're gonna want to win at Twickenham, so that's going to be really exciting. But the most exciting thing for me is is the amount of contracts that are now going out through the nations. That is going to spice things up a lot. That's going to get so much more fun when we're playing Six Nations. Because obviously, beforehand, you'd have girls that come day come in on like a three day camp into a game well from other nations and they'd be working the other days they'd probably be they'd be tired from the last game they'd have to go into work for the other few days like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday come in on Thursday Friday then play Saturday and like I mean I don't want to say it was an un we had the advantage over them because we are a very good talented group of girls but we would we had already done like two week prep camp and then we were in all that week you know prepping for the game it's not like that anymore it's, it's like game time now you know people are ready people are firing yeah I think like Zoe says it's becoming a more level playing field which is fantastic um, you'll get more competitive games and I think within the Six Nations it's still probably a bit broken up by we're probably a little bit further ahead in terms of our development in contracts and the group but I think like those games are going to be spicy, especially with the World 15s coming up and that third place meaning who gets to qualify for the, the top group, like Scotland, Wales, Ireland, Italy are all going to be gunning for each other and they're going to be gunning for us as well. Like anything can happen and it's been a big World Cup and there's a lot of sub stories within the Six Nations story. So it's going to be exciting to watch, definitely. And um, yeah, I agree with all of them. I think it's, it is going to be so exciting because we saw how well 
Italy progressed in their short time of having their contracts and they came out and put some really good scores in. So it'll be so interesting to see how the other teams are and and what's happening. I think it's definitely not going to be a um, an easy, easy ride at all. It's going to be a challenge every single game. Are there any games in the Six Nations? Obviously, you, you've mentioned France there is probably the, the biggest competitor. Is that the game that you most look forward to or are there any other ones for, for personal reasons that you, you really look forward to in that calendar? Mm, I personally just love playing Wales and Wales. I love I playing, love Wales, playing and Wales, Wales and Wales just... and Wales as well. The rivalry is just carried on throughout and yeah. just playing Wales and Wales because you love just killing the crowd. Historic, isn't it? And the crowd are just out for you all the time and it just, that fuels me. I love that love that it's like when we play France away obviously we're playing France at home this year but playing France away is always good because I have a packed out stadium and bands and people booing you and when you're going in from the warm-up I just love it like the best thing last year (laughs) was when we stopped the warm-up the crowd was booing us the crowd was booing and going mental and we were walking in and all of a sudden you see France start trying to sprint on by us I don't know who was leading us in but they legged it and it became a race it became a race to the changing like elbowing each other in the tunnel yeah it was so <laughs> funny I'm like yeah girls we won this we won this we just won the race back to the change <laughs> race we've got this number. game's won already <laughs> we're in their heads uh, but also another game that people don't I don't think people think of this but right when we're playing Italy are always such a tough side to beat I don't know what it is I know sometimes we put quite a big score on them but they're, they are so hard to break down like they feel really hard to break down it always feels like a tough game yeah, they can just be quite unpredictable, can't they? And they just, yeah. they're just relentless with the way that they go they're and go and go. Their defence is unbelievable. Yeah, it will kill you. They're drifty. It gets you every time. Are there any any next gen superstars in the Red Roses camp at the moment? Where it's being at? well, not even necessarily in the Red Roses camp, but in the Six um, Nations. We've had a, there's quite a few names on the um, new new names or new faces that have um, been called in that are on the the squad list so it's actually you know it always happens you know post the World Cup people filter out people filter in uh, coaches come out coaches come in so it's quite an exciting time and it's it's a good time for them to have a crack and put themselves up and be like look I am here I am pushing for uh, the next World Cup and pushing for people's shirts so it, it does get exciting and to get them in early you know the first camp um, and chuck them in see what they can do is, is is exciting and hopefully they'll stay for the the long run and then into the World Cup I think even established players are going to fill different roles as well because Abby's obviously been our line-up leader and although she'll be um, and Zoe Oldcroft does that very well as well but we're going to have to build depth in that position and Zoe's obviously been running our game from 10 but we don't have that luxury anymore so people are going to have to step up from left right and centre and I think that'll be an interesting dynamic to watch and see who who steps up into those roles and is able to direct the team obviously we've lost Skaz we've lost Zoe we've lost Abby from the squad that's three quite big personalities and leaders within that squad so that void's going to have to be filled so I think it's going to be really interesting to see who steps up and that? Back to the scrum. We've got a hell of a lot of different players in. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, just bringing it back to the main focus. Um, yeah, so I'm really excited to see how the girls go. I think there's a few players that have been playing really well in the Premiership. You definitely, you've got Hannah, Hannah Sims who likes to play for every Prem team in the league now. <laughs> and uh, no, but she's been scoring tries for absolutely every single one of them. So she's had the amazing last season and this season excited to see her in training um, but also you know you've got youngsters like Kelsey Clifford in so it'll be it'll be really interesting to see how, how the youngsters do and how the people have just been playing really really well in the Premiership do and hopefully it will we'll put on a good show Well as Christian's already alluded to we're, we're, you're expecting a crowd of over 40,000 at Twickenham for the competition. And I mean, we've already spoken about what that does to you and, and, and how that fires you up. Just just how important, what how significant a milestone do you see that as as the game grows? It's so big. Um, like the goal for the RFU is to sell out Twickenham for the World Cup final. And I mean, we've already basically reached half of that within, we've still got two and a half years to go. So normally our ticket sales, I think, pick up the three, four weeks prior to the actual tournament. So the fact we've already sold nearly 40,000, it's just absolutely phenomenal. Hopefully we surpass that and we get, you know, closer to 60 or whatever. But it just shows how, uh, what a rapid rate 
women's rugby is growing at and how many people are excited to go and watch these games because they know they're going to have some great rugby to, to watch. Um, yeah, so hopefully it, ke- it keeps going up, but I'm really, really looking forward to it. Yeah, and I think likewise around the country, we're selling out stadiums. And if you're not selected, it's a nightmare because you're like, well, where am I going to watch from? Uh, if, if I'm not selected for the France game, am I going to have to watch from the nosebleeds? Like, I don't want to do that. But in, at the same time, it's so good that that's happening for the game. But just means I'm going to have to get on somebody's family and friends list pretty quick. <laughs> uh, well, ladies... That is it for this month's edition of the Player's Voice. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. It is evening, isn't it? Yep. Dark outside, should know that. Uh, A huge thank you to our guests, Sarah Beckett, Sarah Byrne and Zoe Harrison. And of course, my co-host slash other guest, as he calls himself, Christian Day. Uh, Thank you so much for your time. Um, Good luck with the rest of the season. And of course, Zoe, good luck with your recovery. I hope it all goes well. But before we disappear, we want to hear from you. If you have any rugby-related questions you want answering, perhaps the best way to become a Scrum Geek, or any guests that you want to appear on the podcast, then please let us know by tweeting us using the hashtag, hashtag theplayersvoice, or email info at the rpa.co.uk. Once again, thank you to my guests, and thank you to for listening. See you next time.